We're going to launch into Ignite now. Who's ever been to an Ignite before? All right. Well, we'll have five sessions of Ignite, four today, one tomorrow. They're on a bunch of different tracks. And in case you haven't been to one before, what unites all Ignites is each person gets 20 slides, 15 seconds of slide for a total of five minutes on stage. And so it's a great way to get a lot of ideas all at once, and it brings the speakers along with the audience. Uh, it started back in 2006, back when my friend Bree and I were both working with O'Reilly, and he was specifically working on Make. He went on to start MakerBot, and so it was really nice to be a part of the Nation of Makers event. Uh, over the last 11 years, Ignite's really spread around the world. It's found on most continents, and the only reason I say that is just because when you go back to your ho home, if you want to start an Ignite, that is basically what we're all about. I, I actually took Ignite out of O'Reilly a couple of years ago uh, solely so that we could support the community and enable Ignite events, which we found brings communities together. So there's some of the places that we've had Ignites. And really, without further ado, let's bring on the first speaker. Please welcome up Casey. So I don't have to evangelize how awesome makerspaces are to this particular community, but I wanted to talk about the impact that our space has on our neighborhood, because when you're building communities, neighborhood is a building block that matters. Uh, we moved to the neighborhood of Franklinson, which is one of the most underdeveloped neighborhoods near downtown Columbus, Ohio, about four years ago. We did that as a public-private initiative with the Neighborhood Community Development Corporation, FUEL. Um, these are typically entities that work in economic development or affordable housing. In neighborhoods, Frankenstein was deeply ravaged, ravaged by floods about 100 years ago and uh, still is a community that struggles with poverty and underemployment. And we were brought to the neighborhood to bring arts, entrepreneurship, and sidewalk life. So how are we doing? Um, four years later, we're sitting at about 700 members. We teach about 80 classes a month, host meetups and tours, community events, welcome hundreds of visitors, are home to about 40 tenant businesses. Um, so that's a lot of interactions in our space, just in the neighborhood. Uh, let's take a closer look at some of our members. So of those 700 members, we do some annual surveys to kind of get a pulse on what they're doing in our neighborhood and beyond, and about half of them are small business owners at some stage in their development. So they're either rocking a day job and nursing their side hustle on as a part-time entrepreneur or their full-time entrepreneur. Um, about a fifth of them start their business after joining the Idea Foundry, and they, a subset of these 100 business owners employed about 174 people in addition to themselves just last year. Uh, which is a pretty good number. One of those small business owners that launched after joining us is Adlai Stein, who four years ago quit his day job at a law firm to pursue his dream of being a blacksmith full-time, not something that you hear on a daily basis. He is opening the Central Ohio School of Metalwork now later this year, also in our neighborhood. Uh, so not just a jump point, but been able to expand his business. Uh, we've also noticed and been able to document a lot of eternal economies that sprout up. So over half of our members say that they have hired or been hired by a fellow member. Um, they trade referrals and not insignificant number of them turn into paid clients. They also, 60% of them say they visit other neighborhood establishments, other business, bars, restaurants, uh, stores in the neighborhood several times a month or more. A good chunk of them visit every day, <coughs> bars and coffee shops. Um, but that's a lot of money that comes right back into the neighborhood from all of our hundreds of members and small business owners. I feel like that was longer than the 15 seconds. So, um, I want to talk about our education initiatives for a second. So primarily, we've hosted lifelong learners, adult lifelong learners. We see about 2,500 of them in our regular classes any given year over 80 different classes from tools and gardening um, to game dev. We host a number of experts, some from international acclaim in topics of interest from special guest artists to uh, an expert on space elevators who brought samples of carbon nanotubes. So it's kind of a mixed bag of what you might encounter at the Idea Foundry. 
And then we have access, we throw a lot of community festivals, participate in our neighborhood art crawl, and there's even a music series, so people can kind of engage with these ideas, with this expert content, with each other on you know, any, any given day at the Idea Foundry in a part of town that really didn't have that much going on prior to it. And so I want to think about what that means in terms of neighborhood impact, right? So that's hundreds of people being employed, that's hundreds of small business starting and launching, and being sustained, that's internal economies and people spending money in the neighborhood, um, that's creative experiences and lifelong education and educators being trained. Um, and that's a lot. That's a lot for a 65,000 square foot building uh, that's roughly managed by about 12 full-time staff and with the expense of about 1.5 million annually, which you think about that in terms of an investment, like what other kind of neighborhood investment can you make at that little amount of money that has that kind of documented impact, um, both economic impact, education impact, but also just human development impact in a neighborhood. So maker spaces are one of the most efficient investments, most efficient resources that you can bring to a neighborhood level. And we're so happy to be in Franklinson. Not sure if anybody else is from Ohio. I think I heard someone talking about OSU for a second. But um, start at your neighborhoods, work out, build your communities, um, and then document that story because that's an important narrative for lawmakers. Uh, you know, anytime you tout out how many jobs are created in your area, that's important for getting what you need from cities or states or investors. And uh, you can learn more about the Idea Foundry, ideafoundry.com. You can come see me. I'll be around this weekend. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Casey. Uh, our next speaker is Haim. Thank you very much. All right, great. So what you're looking at here are sketches by Leonardo da Vinci in the early 1500s of the moon using his newly discovered telescope. At that point, people were only looking at the moon uh, with their naked eye. And uh, at this point, we were starting to really study the moon more on a scientific level. So my name is Haim Benaroya, the Faculty of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Rutgers in New Jersey. And I'm here to talk about lunar bases, uh, give you an overview of what they're about and some of the difficulties that we encounter to design them, and hopefully in 10 years we'll be there. So to get there, we need rockets. Robert Goddard, you see there, with the first launch of his liquid fueled rocket in 1926. Um, he was uh, known as the father of American rocketry, but rocketry was being developed all over the world in the early 1900s. So Jules Verne was very visionary. On the right, you see another visionary, Arthur C. Clarke, from one of his books, showing a potential lunar settlement. And you'll see some of the structures I'll show you later. These structures are shells because these are very strong structures because of their shape. So the 1960s saw the space race between the Soviets and the Americans. Uh, Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space. And Neil Armstrong there at the top was the first man on the moon. Harrison Schmidt at the bottom was the last man on the moon, the Apollo era. So these are some sketches of uh, lunar bases. You can see there soup pans, horizontal cylinders, they're all pressurized so that people can walk inside without using spacesuits. They're also covered with regolith, the lunar soil, to shield against a very harsh lunar environment. This is a concept of an inflatable structure. We like inflatable structures because we can put them in small packages and rockets, bring them to the moon, inflate them, rigidize them, and then here you see a six-level uh, base. Perhaps that's a second-generation base. Uh, some ideas for what to do on the moon. Uh, Shimizu, a Japanese company, would like to put a solar panel around the lunar equator, like a, like a belt, and then beam power back to Earth or uh, for local, local sources. On the right is a Japanese concept of a lunar base. Other things we'll do on the moon, on the far side we'd like to have an astronomical facility uh, that uh, shields us from the Earth noise. Uh, as structural engineers, we have to be able to build these kind of structures in that environment, a very challenging environment for all kinds of instrumentation. Uh, space. Uh, uh, tourism, here's a lunar Hilton concept from 1990. So we see the inside of, of the base uh, with some of the crater exposed. On the right side, there's the base and some huge meteorite coming toward you. So if it's not exciting enough to be on the moon, 
maybe a meteorite will make that exciting. Uh, here's a large, uh, very large facility for sports. The Lunar 16G would allow you to do six times, six, six times as much what you can do on Earth. Jump 60 feet in the air, hang glide, throw your pal over the, over the coast. Anyway, so here's, a, here's another inflatable structure. This is a TransHab, which is a NASA concept, licensed by Bigelow Aerospace. One of these is now docked at the space station for two years of trials to test the, the materials that are there and how they can deal with a harsh environment. Eventually, a lunar base can be made out of one of those. Here are two inflatable lunar, uh, lunar structures with greenhouses in the back. So this might be for approximately 20 people uh, permanently inhabiting the lunar, uh, the lunar surface. Uh, the greenhouses, because we need plants for oxygen and food, you can see the greenhouse there on the left. On the right side, you see astronauts unrolling a solar panel in a crater. Uh, using it as a solar collector for energy. On the moon, you have two weeks of daylight, two weeks of nighttime, so solar power is a great source of energy. Eventually, we think that our lunar bases will be underground. On the right, you see a photograph of a uh, lava tube. They're newly discovered. The one you see there is almost 300 uh, feet in diameter, about 150 feet deep. These large volumes are very valuable because they allow us to, to build uh, underground eventually. Eventually, we have to build using robots, because astronauts can't survive on the lunar surface too much. This robot here you see is using local resources to build a, a structure completely autonomously. Some of the challenges for the robots is the regolith, which is a very deadly material. It gets into all the joints. Uh, here's another, this is actually a Soviet concept of a buried structure. You can see the one at the bottom, uh, a very vast structure built by robots and then covered with regolith, the, the light gray structure. Uh, so this is a huge city for hundreds of people and eventually that's how we might live there. So at Rutgers, we've been working on simple designs, this igloo-shaped structure. Uh, you can see on the left, the regular forces acting down. On the right, the internal pressurization. So it turns out that the inter internal pressurization is a critical loading on these structures as far as the design goes. So we do a thermal analysis. We have very large temperature extremes on the surface. On the top, you see lunar noon with the hot and cold sides. And the arrows on the top right, you can see where heat is being coming out of the structure because it's uh, much colder outside. And at the bottom you can see, uh, you could have seen um, how it looks at, at midnight. So robots, local resources, low gravity effects on humans, going to the moon first instead of Mars, and benefits for all on Earth. So feel free to contact me if you want more, more details. There's a lot more details than what's there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, we have one more speaker. Is Natasha in the room? All right, Natasha, you are up. Hello, hello. Oh, wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Natasha. And the one thing that I really love about making things is that you absolutely are guaranteed to learn something. And what I want to share with you today is my journey and the lessons that I've learned trying to invite more girls into the maker movement. So when I was a kid, I loved making things, but I loved making things with paper and glitter and clay and craft supplies. I thought that computers looked really cool, but no one ever really offered me the opportunity to build one. So then I started doing Maker Fairs with some friends and attending Maker Fair. And this is what Maker Fair looks like to me. <laughs> really cool <laughs> tech, but like in a shell of kind of manly stuff. So I decided to do a project for Maker Faire uh, that would make an eight-year-old girl like me want to participate in it. And this was the criteria. So first, okay, so it would be crafty and expressive. It would be unique to each maker. It would be simple so you could build it with no experience. It would be inexpensive so that it was accessible by even people with a little money. I'm talking too fast because I'm nervous. <laughs> um, it would be fun and quick, five minute project could do something great. It would be shareable, so you are proud to share, share it and show it off to your friends and social media, and that it would combine craft and tech, so you would have a first experience building technology with craft. And this is what I came up with. A series of paper flowers that could be stacked, mixed and matched to design uh, your own unique thing, and then worn as a pin. And I'm wearing one today. So then I thought, wait, would boys want to do this? Am I excluding the boys in the audience? I want every boy to also want to come make with me too. I don't want to do like the reverse <coughs> problem. So then I came up with bow ties. 
So a play on formal wear. So we have the girls with some flowers, maybe the boys would want some bow ties. I thought this was going to be a great project. So I decided to take it back to Maker Faire and it was awesome. So I had a line of people around my booth. Everyone was making, everyone was taking selfies. It was a great time. I had friends helping me and we made, uh, I think, 400 projects and ran out of them. So I said, this is great. I'm going to try to do this as often with as many makers as possible. So I did two Kickstarters to make as many of these little paper pieces as possible. One for the flowers and one for the bow ties. And then I booked every event that I could across the nation to go do this uh, with as many kids as, as needed. So I got the chance to build this project with kids in cities all over. I even had the chance to pitch the project on a national TV show and do it with some kids there. So I learned a lot about having thousands of interactions with first time makers. One thing I really noticed was that I was a little bit wrong about the bow tie for boys and flowers for a girl thing, right? So I thought, yeah, maybe a few people would go the uh, non less traditional route, I guess, with a bow tie for girls and a bow tie or a bow tie for boys, flower for girls. So I made a commitment to ask every kid, "Hey, would you like to make a bow tie or a flower?" Every single kid, exactly the same way. And what ended up happening was about 30% of the kids who chose the non-traditional thing, I noticed the parents standing behind them would second guess them. Some of them would suggest the opposite. Uh, and that was universal across the US. So it was some, an interesting thing to watch that happen. I also learned about my own bias when I would say, to a very feminine looking girl, I would say, would you like a bow or a flower? I left off the tie. And that I think was my own bias coming out unconsciously, accidentally, I don't mean it, but it's interesting to be aware. So let me share with you what's working. Oh, and that slide is a little messed up. Uh, but the th three things that are working are, I made something that was a simple project that had a choosable outcome. So every kid could participate, but make it their own. And we're going a little faster. But uh, the, the second thing was that uh, I would be aware of, uh, sorry, it's good to be aware of your own biases, something to learn. And with a project like that, you'd be able to make something that allows both boys and girls and all makers to create without boundaries. So thank you. All right, thank you for, to all of our speakers. Thank you, Wolves. Uh, we're now going to take a break until 11 o'clock when we'll have the sustainable talks. Come on. <laughs>